Hello and welcome. The Giffen, DiMatteis, and Maguire version of the Justice League is not only one of the best versions of that team, but it may be one of the most unique superhero titles ever published. To give one an idea of how unusual this title was, it ran during a time when grim and gritty was all the rage. The impact of Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns permeated many mainstream superhero titles. The trend was towards serious, grounded heroes with moral conflicts or morally questionable behavior. In some respects, the Justice League followed this trend, but with a completely different approach. The characters were grounded and well-established. They felt human with their own unique traits. Perhaps the best way to explain it is to say it was like an early reality TV show where the stars are actually interesting people. Periodically, they'd save the world and stop evil plots, but we also got a good look at the interpersonal relationships that develop when they aren't in the public eye. There was camaraderie, jealousy, friendly bonding, petty bickering, and lots of humor. The creators have described these intimate moments as locker room banter. It's all the stuff that happens after the big fight, when the heroes are sitting around, unwinding, and having a few beers. In the context of the late 80s, this approach should have been a failure. Instead, it thrived, and it became a sleeper hit during its five-year run. The Justice League of America began in 1960, and it was published continuously until 1987. During its original lifespan, it saw many different iterations with many different team members. During the Silver Age, the team was located in Happy Harbor and had an annoying teen sidekick, Snapper Carr. For the bulk of the 70s, the team orbited the planet in a satellite. In the 80s, the team fell apart and reformed with a host of third-tier characters. This period is unaffectionately known as the Detroit Era. In other words, like the city itself, the team was in a steep decline. Its good years were in the distant past. For a team that had allegedly inspired the Fantastic Four, thus the empire that became Marvel Comics, the 80s were a rather dire time. Following the continuity cleaning event, Crisis on Infinite Earths, DC took the opportunity to reboot and reinterpret its entire line of comics. As a result, Justice League was cancelled with the intent of giving the team a fresh start. Technically, the reboot of the Justice League began in the miniseries Legends. At best, it's the announcement of a new beginning for the team. The members loosely resemble those that would be in the actual series. For example, Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash were not a part of the new lineup. Early in the new series, both Doctor Fate and Captain Marvel would take their leave. So, literally, half of the heroes displayed in Legend would not join the JLA or would leave early in the series. The more well-known characters, Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash, all had recently rebooted solo titles, and the editors of those titles wouldn't allow their characters to join the Justice League. Presumably, this was to avoid any continuity clashes between the Justice League and the solo titles. Crisis had cleaned everything up, and those editors wanted to keep current continuity tidy. But it may have also been because no one wanted to associate their characters with a team that had been a total failure. After all, the maligned Detroit era was still fresh in everyone's memory. The only editor that took pity on the new Justice League was Denny O'Neill. He allowed Batman to be included because the title needed one original member with some name recognition. Otherwise, without Batman, this reboot would look like a new version of the Detroit era. That wouldn't exactly give the title a fresh beginning, nor would it be enticing to new readers. The series that would become Justice League began with the editor, Andy Helfer, who was the final editor of the original series. Helfer brought Keith Giffen into the project to write scripts. At the time, Giffen was laying low in the industry. He was primarily known as an artist, whose early style was heavily influenced by Jack Kirby. Circa 1985, his style took a dramatic turn, as seen in Ambushbug, published that year. This, and other work, came under heavy criticism in 1986. The Comics Journal ran an article that essentially accused Giffen of plagiarizing the work of the Argentinian artist, José Munoz. And, the evidence was quite compelling. As a result, Giffen looked to transition into being a writer. However, Giffen felt more confident plotting a story rather than writing full scripts. So that required Helfer to find someone to actually script the series. J.M. Diamatteis was responsible for writing the storyline that concluded the original Justice League, so he had recently worked on the series with Helfer, and when Helfer approached him to write the script to Giffen's plot, 
he turned the job down. However, Helfer persisted, and DiMatteis eventually relented. He agreed to take the job, even though he thought a scriptwriter was unnecessary. Giffen's plots were essentially in the form of mini-comics. He would sketch out a full comic with dialogue and thumbnails, and that mini-comic would be passed on to DiMatteis. DiMatteis would then translate that mini-comic into a proper script, adding or cleaning up bits of dialogue and adding a few character beats here and there. According to DiMatteis, it wasn't a challenging process whatsoever. Giffen's plotting was tight and on point, so there really wasn't a lot for him to do. This was the reason he originally passed on the project. It was a bit too easy. But DiMatteis did add what he could into the spaces that allowed for elaboration. The formal script then passed to the slightly unknown artist, Kevin Maguire. As acknowledged by both writers, Maguire was an essential element to the success of the series. That's an assessment that's hard to dispute. Maguire's artwork was not only dynamic and easy to look at, but he added a very essential element to the project, realistic expressions. This provided a grounded emotional range that's not ordinarily seen in superhero material. Usually, most expressions are basic reactions, or overreactions, and in between reactions, the characters are usually flat-faced and expressionless. They look like actors who are merely waiting to say their next line. In essence, Maguire gave these characters an internal life that lived through their expressions. It is such a simple but effective technique. It shows the characters are present in some capacity. They're not simply elements to fill up a panel. Furthermore, their expressions display a range of emotion. This allowed for a fair amount of character subtlety. These three creators, who rarely spoke to one another during the course of the series, would add their own unique approach to the title. It was like they all spoke with one voice. As a collaboration, it was seamless and organic. It may be one of the greatest underrated creative teams ever assembled on one title. The series went through a few title changes that reflected the changes in the series itself. It began as Justice League, before becoming Justice League International. Finally, it became Justice League America when the spin-off title, Justice League Europe, was launched. Overall, the team went from being a reassembled group of misfits to an international peacekeeping force recognized by the United Nations. This transition into a chartered division of the UN was envisioned by the businessman Maxwell Lord. Max Lord was an interesting addition. He was, in essence, the manager of the team, and his motives were always a touch suspect. While not necessarily evil, Max Lord wasn't motivated by altruism. He was morally ambiguous. His unrecognized superpower, so to speak, was amassing power and authority by exploiting the Justice League brand. His actual superpower was the ability to influence people. This is not something that comes into play too often. Regardless, he used all the power at his disposal to get what he wanted, which, quite honestly, appeared to be nothing more than fame and fortune. Critically speaking, the first year of the series is mostly well-balanced, and it feels like a complete story arc. The team is assembled and established. The character dynamics are also put into place, the most well-known being the classic bromance between Blue Beetle and Booster Gold. This, along with Guy Gardner's delusional level of self-importance, are character traits that endure to this day. The same applies to the Martian Manhunter's love of Oreo cookies. Arguably, issue number five has one of the most infamous, memorable scenes in recent superhero history. That would be the fight between Guy Gardner and Batman. While fight may be a bit too generous of a description, its outcome happens in half a second. Other than being character perfect and a funny moment, it's an important scene because it sets the tone for the entire series. It also gave the title some notoriety. Still, this is a moment when the series felt like it was announcing its mission statement. It'll be odd, it will be funny, and it will surprise you and somewhat subvert your expectations of what a team book should be. After that first year, the series becomes a bit untethered. It appears the creative team was given a fair amount of latitude due to its success, and it became a madcap farce. Critically speaking, while not terrible, the friendly banter seems a bit too much in certain situations. It reads like it could have been edited down overall. There's not a lot of breathing room in each scene. All empty spaces are filled with someone saying something that may not be strictly necessary. Again, nothing wrong with that approach, unless it's done all the time, by all the characters, throughout the entire issue. Then it really stands out and feels a bit repetitive. 
This year is best described as a combination of the Marx Brothers and the Three Stooges. It has rapid-fire witty dialogue and slapstick situations. For better or for worse, it's way over the top. During the third year, the series settles into place. It finds a balance between the goofy antics and actual storytelling, as opposed to going out of its way to find comedic or ridiculous situations to insert superheroes. It still maintains its behind-the-scenes feel, but the zaniness is kept to a more realistic medium. It reserves the utter craziness for special issues or annuals. With this new balance established, the series becomes a more standard title with an unusual approach. For lack of a better term, it matures into a character drama with situational, comedic scenes. Justice League stays in this mode until Giffen and DiMatteis conclude their run with the 60th issue. One could suggest this series is reminiscent of Brian Michael Bendis' work, especially on team books like The Avengers. With Bendis, characters tend to stand around discussing what they don't understand about the plot. It's usually done to fill in the reader and to move the story forward. With Giffen and DiMatteis, the characters usually discuss themselves or those around them. For the most part, the actual plot is secondary to the interpersonal antics. There's no rush to get to a final confrontation with whatever bad guy is around. In some cases, they're blissfully ignorant of there being any evil plots. So while this approach appears to be somewhat similar, they are quite different. Still, it's a good example of contrasting styles that lead to completely different results. It also shows the uniqueness of this series. For example, in modern times, there's always some big reality-threatening force of evil to challenge the team. The antagonist is always some variety of a world-dominating megalomaniac. Basically, the stakes are immeasurably high, and if the team fails, everyone dies. With this version of the Justice League, the threats are minor annoyances. With the exception of a few crossovers and events, the stakes are quite low, or so absurd they're difficult to take seriously. Again, there are exceptions, such as the shockingly brutal Despero story, but these serious threats are few and far between. The overall challenge seems to be, how do all of these different characters get along, and how is it they're so effective when they work together? Because, on the surface, this team should be a dismal failure. Yet somehow they overcome their differences and conflicting styles to actually be rather useful. So it's a series about character, not doom and gloom conflict. Basically, it's the opposite of what one might expect from a superhero team book, especially in modern times. It's not always perfect, but it gets more right than it gets wrong. To slightly underscore its uniqueness, this is an approach that hasn't been used before or since. Years later, the original creative team would do other projects along the same lines, but it's a style that has yet to be replicated by anyone else. Personally, I can't think of any examples that are remotely similar, even on a basic level. But I haven't read everything ever published, so that statement may be wrong. Feel free to make suggestions in the comments section below. Perhaps the best phrase to describe the series is unconventional. It looks and feels like a superhero comic, but it adheres to no one's definition of a standard team. As mentioned at the beginning, it's more of a reality TV show than a sitcom. Obviously, the events are scripted and plotted, but it feels like it flows organically. And, in the end, that's what makes it work so well.